Hello everyone. Welcome again to our tutorials on chemistry. Today we will learn about periodic table. Before we dive into understanding periodic table in detail, let us have a look at its history of evolution. We can give the credit of its beginning to a French scientist, Antoine Lavoisier, who is also known as the father of modern chemistry. In 1777, he was the first to establish that sulfur was an element and not a compound. In 1778, he named oxygen and in 1783, he named hydrogen. Please note, he did not discover them. Hydrogen was discovered by Henry Cavendish and the credit for the discovery of oxygen goes to Joseph Priestley. Further, he is credited with putting together the first extensive list of elements, which he classified as metals and non-metals. He is also known for discovering that although matter may change its form or shape, its mass always remains the same. Here let me tell you a small story about the life of the father of modern chemistry, Antoine Lavoisier. At the height of the French Revolution, he was accused of selling adulterated tobacco and of other crimes. For this, he was tried, convicted and guillotined all on May 8, 1794 in Paris at the age of 50. As the story goes, many arguments were made to spare his life so that he could continue his experiments. The judge did not want to be swayed. So he responded that the Republic needed neither scientists nor chemists and that justice could not be delayed. And a year and a half after his death, Lavoisier was exonerated by the French government. That's life for you. Or say, death. And then came Dobrenier's triad. In 1829, he arranged certain elements with similar properties in group of three in such a way that the atomic mass of the middle element was nearly the same as the average atomic mass of the first and third elements. Well, the limitation was very few elements could be covered under triads. And then in 1866 came the Newlands law of octaves. John Newlands, an English chemist, proposed the law of octaves by stating that when elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic masses, every eighth element has properties similar to the first, just like musical notes. But this generalization was also rejected because it could not be extended to the elements with atomic masses more than 40. And then came Lothar Mayer's atomic volume curve. In 1869, Lothar Mayer plotted a graph between atomic volume of the elements and their atomic mass. And he pointed that the elements with similar properties occupy similar position in the curve. Well, this model also had its limitations. And then came the most famous Mendeleev's periodic law. He stated the physical and chemical properties of the elements are periodic function of their atomic mass. Mendeleev arranged all the elements known at that time in increasing order of atomic mass and this arrangement became periodic table. In a periodic table, horizontal lines are called periods and vertical lines are called groups. Well, this was the precursor to our modern periodic table. There were some anomalies which were evident in the Mendeleev's periodic table as well. And finally, modern periodic law was given by Mosley. According to Mosley, the physical and chemical properties of the elements are periodic function of their atomic numbers. So, there is just one difference between Mosley's law and Mendeleev's law. Mendeleev tried to arrange the elements on the basis of their atomic weight, whereas Mosley tried to arrange them on basis of their atomic number. It might seem very obvious to us today, but it was really an important discovery. Now that we have understood the history of periodic table, it's time we understand its use in inorganic chemistry. Look at this color-coded periodic table. First of all, it is broadly classified as non-metals and metals. Here the non-metals are on the right hand side of the periodic table which are coded in shades of green and maroon. Then you can also see metalloids in the shade of green 
because this has properties of both metal and non-metals. All other color-coded elements are metals. Let's begin our understanding with metals. Do you remember what are the vertical columns called as? Yes, they are called groups. So let's start with the first group. Here other than hydrogen, all other elements, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium and francium, they are all metals and they are commonly called as alkali metals. They are very reactive. Metals such as sodium and potassium react so vigorously with oxygen that they catch fire if kept in the open. Hence, to protect them and to prevent accidental fires, they are kept immersed in kerosene oil. Now, let's move to the second group which has beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium and radium. These elements are commonly called as alkali earth metals. Again, these metals are also very reactive. Now, an interesting property of periodic table. Please always remember this as a rule. Whenever we move from top to bottom in a group, the metallic character will always increase. And when we move from left to right in a periodic table, the metallic character will decrease. If you remember the electronic configuration that we learned in our last video, it will be of immense help here. We can use the understanding of electronic configuration to understand this periodic table in a much better way. So, all the group 1 metals, which are also called alkali metals, have a common property in terms of electronic configuration. They all have just one valence electron, that is the number of electron in their outermost shell. And we learned that all elements try to achieve their nearest noble gas configuration. So by now you must have guessed why these metals are so reactive because they just have to lose one electron. Similarly, for the alkali earth metal which is our group 2, they each will have two electrons in their valence shell. And again, losing two electrons though more difficult than losing one electron will be easier. So even these metals are very reactive. Now look at all the elements in yellow. These are called transition elements. Compared to alkali and alkali earth metal, they are less reactive. Now look at the purple and dark purple elements. They are called lanthanides and actinides. These are heavy elements and are mostly radioactive in nature. Let's now move to the right hand side of the periodic table. You remember the rule that the metallic character increases as we move from top to down in a group and it is exactly the opposite for non-metals. The non-metallic tendency will decrease when we move from top to down in a group and will increase when we move from left to right in a period of a periodic table. Please note, noble gases are exception here because they already have a stable electronic configuration. The right hand part of the periodic table will become very interesting. Now look at the group starting with B, which is boron. We have moved from left to right in the periodic table and hence some of the metallic tendency has started to decrease. So boron becomes a metalloid. But now we also know that when we move from top to bottom in a group, the metallic tendency increases. So an element coming after the metalloid boron becomes a metal, which is aluminium. And hence, gallium, indium and titanium are all metals. Now let's move to the group starting with carbon. Now as we have moved right in the periodic table from metalloid, we are likely to encounter a non-metal. But when we move down the group below carbon, we are likely to first meet a metalloid, which is silicon. Following silicon, we have germanium, which is also a metalloid. And as we go further down the group, we have tin and lead which are metals. Now let's move to nitrogen. Here as expected, nitrogen is a non-metal as it comes towards right hand side of carbon which is already a non-metal. Now as we move down from nitrogen to phosphorus, it is still a non-metal. But as we go below phosphorus in the group, 
we meet arsenic and antimony which are metalloids but bismuth is a metal now let's move to oxygen again as expected it has got to be a non metal and a strong non metal as we go below oxygen we have sulfur and selenium which are also non metals but as we go further down tellurium and polonium becomes metalloid and now finally we move to the far right of the periodic table before the noble gases and we have reached fluorine so as per our rule fluorine has to show the strongest non metallic character and as we move down the group the non metallic character decreases but they are still all non metals we have a special name for this group which is called halogens so fluorine chlorine bromine iodine and astatine are all known as halogens and finally we come to the noble gases which are helium neon argon krypton xenon and radon which are all inert because they have stable electronic configuration now that we have located the metals and non metals it is a good time to see how they are different from each other metals generally have luster that is shine all metals are generally solid except mercury which is a liquid they are good conductors of heat and electricity silver is the best while copper stands second they are ductile that is they can be drawn into wire gold is the most ductile metal they are malleable which means they can be hammered into thin sheets they are sonorous that is they make a ringing sound when they are hit and metals can form positive ions by losing electrons to non metals metals combine with oxygen to form basic oxides now if you look at non metals they do not have luster they do not conduct heat and electricity they are not ductile they are not malleable they are not sonorous also unlike metals non metals form acidic oxides please note they are the broad properties of metals and non metals so now i hope you can see periodic table in much better light you can easily find where the metals are and where the non metals are you can look at the periodic table and say which metal is likely to exhibit more metallic character and which elements show non metallic character so with this understanding we can close our module on periodic table in the next module we will go out looking for these metals unfortunately because of their reactive nature they are not found in free state they are found in compound state in minerals so we'll look at the important minerals and which element we can separate from them see you then